We're going to hear from uh, Jill Weeks. Um, Jill is the Environmental and Regulatory Affairs Director of Veolia. Um, she's been through, through that heavily uh, involved uh, in the consultation processes uh, on, on the new re regime. Uh, she also chairs um, uh, one of the DEFRA, the DEFRA Hazardous Waste Forum. Um, and she represents industry, of course, uh, very much on the sharp end of what is happening. Uh, so we're very much looking forward to hearing you know, how it's going in, in practice from Jill. We're going um, well, good evening, everybody. Um, my, uh, my job here is to give you an industry viewpoint. I perhaps should say waste industry or waste and resources industry viewpoint, because although Peter's been talking about radioactive substances and, and other areas, uh, the company that I work for is essentially involved in, uh, in waste management, which is uh, a very heavily regulated uh, industry. As Peter said, um, the EPP1 really has only been in place since the 6th of April last year, so we've only had 13 months, so it's probably a little bit early to give you a full uh, view of what industry thinks about it, but I'm going to have an attempt. But I just thought we'd have a couple of slides for those of you who don't know who Veolia are. Veolia Environnement uh, is the French parent company and a worldwide player uh, on four fronts, really. We have 330,000 employees worldwide and a £36.2 billion pound turnover. And we're in the four areas that you see on the screen there. Um, water, where we operate in 64 countries uh, and 93,500 employees there. And that's really water supply um, rather than actually sort of, you know, like United Utilities cleaning up the water. It tends to be water supply. Um, energy. Um, some of you may know this company as Dalkia. It still trades as Dalkia because it's a 50% venture between uh, Veolia, Environnement and uh, EDF. And that operates in 41 countries uh, with about 53,000 employees. Veolia Transport connects trains, um, buses, uh, operate again throughout the world, 28 countries. Not, they've, they've got a few operations here in the UK, um, but they're much bigger in, in France than actually in the Far East. And they've got 84,000 employees. But the one that I'm really here to talk to you about is waste, um, where we have waste management activities worldwide in 32 countries, and we have 105,000 employees. So that's actually the biggest on the employer front, but that's basically because you have a lot of people running around in vehicles picking up waste from people's houses. Oh, sorry, I'm backwards. Just looking very quickly, and this is the last slide telling you about Veolia. Uh, Veolia in the UK um, is, as you see there, 12,500 people. I understand we have the fourth biggest transport fleet, and again, that's really men with vehicles running around collecting domestic waste. We do a full range of these service uh, provisions, commercial services, hazardous waste collection and treatment, industrial site services where we work on people's, um, you know, uh, oil refineries or whatever. We also have offshore decommissioning and marine waste activities, um, integrated management services. We have packaging schemes, including uh, uh, normal packaging. We've got a WE compliance scheme and we're just setting up a batteries compliance scheme. And we do local authority collection, recycling, disposal, street cleaning, <laughs> landscapes, and PFI contracts. So we're pretty much in all aspects. And just to put it into the context of, of today's talking, we have just over 200 permits in the UK uh, from the Environment Agency. So uh, we contribute just a little bit to the, uh, to the coffers of the Environment Agency. Uh, my role as Regulatory Affairs Director is really looking at the legislation as it's coming from Europe. I do some work with the European Trade Association, FIAD, um, and then also with DEFRA and the Environment Agency here to look at the, environment, uh, to look at the regulations as they come in. Um, and I think one of the things that I've said on my next slide, a new beginning, um, you know, all credit, and this is not sort of creeping to Peter here, but I think it really was... Uh, breaking new ground, really, um, the way that this piece of legislation came in. It was very much a collaborative effort, um, or we felt from an industry perspective, that there was quite a lot of consultation between DEFRA, industry, and the Environment Agency. Um, lots of stakeholder workshops, which we found very beneficial. 
And I think for probably the first time that I can remember, this piece of legislation came in without too much kicking and screaming um, from the industry. So, you know, credit where credit's due. Um, as, as Peter's already said, proportionate and risk-based. We obviously from industry um, hoped it had the potential to reduce costs. The flexibility um, that was offered um, by this new regime was, was new. We liked um, that. And as Peter said, you know, no longer a one-size-fits-all regime. We were going to be able to sort of mix and match. And particularly like the ability to consolidate waste management licensing um, and PPC legislation into one document because we have a number of sites where we've got, we had PPC permits and a number of waste management licenses and so we welcome the flexibility. Um, the other thing that I haven't really gone into to any detail tonight but that was along at the same time was a flexibility in technical competence because one of the things that's uh, relatively unique to the waste industry is we have to demonstrate that all our operators hold certificates of technical competence to actually hold an environment agency permit. And um, there's a new regime come in, um, which, which is a little bit more flexible uh, on that score. So just looking specifically at how it's affected us, um, if we look at, say, new permits and the variations of, of major facilities... And I have to say at this point that most of the larger waste management activities, landfills, etc., all come under the sort of big banner, uh, and we have to have a, a you know, as a major facilities. So our vision when we were working with the, the regulations before they came in, and our expectation was it should be a much easier process. Um, the idea of these uh, standard permits uh, we liked, and we thought, well, you know, we'd only need probably bespoke for the more complex facilities. This really wasn't, well, he said, still an ongoing vision. I mean, one thing we would like to see would be for planning to be linked in with, with our permitting operations. We have to go through extremely lengthy planning, which I'm sure a lot of you in this room will uh, have worked on with, with people, um, getting planning permission, and then you have to go back and give very similar information, but in a different format um, for permitting. Um, the reality... Um, the, the application process we found is actually more complicated uh, than we would have liked. If you want a small variation uh, to a complex site, say increasing the volume by only two or three hundred tonnes per annum through the plant, the application procedure is very demanding. Um, and the people who actually physically do that within Veolia have told me that they thought it was easier under the old system. Now, that's probably because they knew the old system and it, you, it does take time to work your way through. Um, we, I mean, an example, really, we, 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 this is a real example. We had a, a large transfer station with a small treatment facility which was shredding waste um, to be burnt uh, in an energy recovery facility. The shredding facility was limited at the time to 50 tonnes per day, which meant it was within the uh, waste management licensing regime. We wanted to increase it to above 50 tonne a day um, to, sh to, to be able to shred more, uh, and we had to put in an application, obviously, to vary. The permit had to then be changed from a waste management licence to an installation because the 50 tonne trigger was over. So it was the same operation, just with more waste through the shredder, and I have to say it's taken over 12 months, and we've only just received the draft permit. So that really hasn't been too much of a success story. The other problems we've had were things like um, at one of our depots, we have road sweepers um, go back and they want to decant the water, uh, discharge the water. That needs a bespoke permit um, because it doesn't fit within the standard rules and there's no exception. So again, we're going through quite a lengthy process uh, for a bespoke permit. Um, and in some areas, so for example, one of our dry waste transfer stations, which is a very large facility, over 75,000 tonnes, clearly not a standard rules permit, um, it's a, but it was in the past a waste operation, not an installation, uh, tier three operation. And it's been difficult to work out, and, and I have to say the agency people on the ground have found it difficult to where that sits within the new regime. So whilst that's a little bit critical, um, I think, you know, these will all iron out over time, um, but it has been a little bit difficult sort of first time, you know, first time around. 
on variations, transfers and surrenders. Um, this, this, is, this really has been an improvement because it's, it's much easier to do a partial surrender or transfer. It was pretty much difficult, if not impossible, under the old waste management licensing regime. So, um, under the old waste management system, if you wanted to make changes to the terms of the licence, you'd have to apply for a brand new permit. Um, but now you can actually just apply for a variation. So, I think on this area, you know, we're happy that things are moving forward um, and some good progress has been made, particularly on the low-risk sites. There are still some complaints from our guys out in the field saying that the application form is more complex, but as I say, I think they'll get used to that as time moves on. Um, Peter talked about consolidated permits, and I mentioned earlier um, about one of the things that we looked forward to at the beginning was where we had a number of permits on a single site. We were looking forward to being, being able to rationalise that into uh, a single permit. The reality has actually been quite disappointing and progress has been slow. Um, the, the, I put here the I from IPPC, but the integrated feel to it, we feel, hasn't really come through. Um, we're still being told by agency inspectors on the ground that they're too busy to consolidate our permits um, because it would take them an awful lot of time. I mean, an example again, one of our sites, we had three waste management licences. We then moved over to the IPPC regime and we had three waste management licences and a PPC. So we've got four environmental permits. And we've been told categorically that we cannot merge them together at this point because it really would be too much work uh, and because they're all quite different permits. So the inspectors are saying we'd have to go right back to the beginning and, and almost as if we were starting again. With a, with a greenfield slack site. So it is quite a disappointing area. The other thing that we, we're starting to think about now is do we really want to consolidate our permits because where we have had problems with variations, we're thinking, well, for example, if we have a large site, an incinerator, for example, with a small waste management transfer station or whatever on the side, um, by keeping them separate, it might be easier if we want to vary the transfer permit. Um, it's unlikely that we'd ever want to vary the incinerator permit, so we're thinking it might actually be easier to keep them separate. And there's no indication at this time that if we did or were even encouraged to consolidate the permits that we would be saving any money. Um, the inference is that costs could even be higher. So that's perhaps a little bit disappointing from our perspective. The standard rules permits, um, good news really, We've, there's been good progress here. The application is certainly less onerous and delivery uh, is much faster. Um, I have to say they're probably more useful to the smaller operators than big companies like ourselves. We tend to have very large facilities which um, generally demand bespoke permits. We do have some standard rules permits for things like um, the, the smaller waste transfer stations. One thing we'd like, you know, we'd like, I mean, I, and I'm sure the agency are looking to expand the standard <coughs> rules, uh, permit scale sort of thing. Uh, what we'd like to see in there are closed landfills, you know, where we're monitoring, we've got a closed landfill that's just really subject to um, continuous monitoring. Um, we'd like that to be seen as a standard rule, rule permit. Um, but as I say, generally speaking, we think these are very good. Um, but as I said, not, not hugely useful to us other than for, for the very small sites. Um, Peter mentioned guidance, and in fact he had two very nice slides showing how the guidance interacts. And, and clearly, you know, industry, we need good guidance. But we're finding on the ground that there's confusion with the agency officers about what is guidance and what is an absolute requirement. Um, and the levels of guidance are quite complicated. As you saw, I mean, you, you can see from Peter's slide, the tiers of guidance are quite complex. Um, they might not be for you lawyers, but they are for us waste operators on the ground. You know, you've got the DEFRA guidance, of which there are five, looking at the core directive requirements. We've got the EPR guidance, of which there are ten. We've got the SGN, which is the back reference guidance to PPC. We've got horizontal guidance, which is PPC related. We know the, the waste treatment breath is due to be revised in Seville. 
in 2011, so guidance, and working your way through that is really quite complicated. It's particularly complicated for the Environment Agency officers on the ground. And we sometimes find that we're up against people wielding a piece of guidance, which we don't know whether it's draft, we don't know whether it's in, we don't actually know what the status is, whether it's statutory guidance or not. And that's quite, um, uh, quite confusing and, and you know, puts us into a bit of a conflict situation. The other complaint, if it's want of a better word, is that some of the guidance is exceedingly long. Uh, over hundreds of pages uh, and, and again we just feel that the, you know, whilst the, the, the vision of this, uh, this legislation was to simplify things some of the guidance has really taken on a, a life of its own really uh, and, and is quite complicated and we just think that there is room for simplification there Costs um, the Minister uh, announced when he announced the regs that the regulations will reduce the administrative burden for industry and regulators saving around £76 million over 10 years. Well, bring it on. Um, because our costs have actually risen by £100,000. Um, I mean, there's the exact figure to the pound of our fees and charges for 2008. Um, the fees for 2007 were £1,184,000. £1,644, so it's give or take um, £100,000 increase. Um, that, for us, you know, is, is a significant amount of money. And so, you know, we would like to see consolidation and we'd like to see those costs, costs coming down. Um, you know, it is a big outlay for industry and, um, you know, we, 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 we need to see that. One of the things I think I skipped over on one of the earlier slides, talking about um, uh, where we're looking at fees and charges, uh, we need to sort of really have a, a better system of measuring uh, compliance because the agency have now introduced um, a regime where they charge more or are able to charge more for fees and charges um, if the site is not performing well. And we are finding across the country with 200 sites that some of the sites that we audit internally and think are satisfactory um, are audited by the agency and are satisfactory. And then others that we think are better than that actually come out more badly with the agency when they come and audit. So we need to be able to demonstrate consistency in the scoring system um, and the way the agency actually assesses. I know it's always going to be, it's always going to be a bit of a contentious issue, but I think we need to have a, a little bit more consistency there. And I know the agency have taken that on board, and, and there are some sort of training days and sessions where we ourselves can send our auditors out with, with agency inspectors uh, and vice versa. I mentioned just briefly about technical competence as well. Um, we think that the, the new, more flexible technical competence scheme um, will actually save big companies like ourselves a bit of money because we're able to sort of show corporate competence and more internal training. So that, that's another good move for us there. So to conclude, you know, the waste industry really did and does embrace this new era uh, of, of a more inclusive regulation uh, and as Peter said, it certainly saves juggling loads of pieces of legislation up in the air. Um, again, I want to say, you know, the, the process of developing this legislation was very inclusive, and I do hope that DEFRI uses it as a model uh, going forward. But it probably is too early to say, and it sounds as if I've sort of whinged about what's bad about it, um, but I guess that's what I'm here for. Um, and it's probably too early to say whether costs will be reduced over time. I think overall, you know, it's fair to say we are, you know, relatively happy with it, as relative, uh, you know, as the waste industry would be. Um, but, you know, I put here, we, we do need this consistency of regulation, I mean, the upside, we really are seeing things getting better. Um, you know, applications now that we're putting in are, have been turned around quicker and we're finding that there's more willingness uh, for the agency to discuss with us, you know, the process critical issues or the business critical issues, should I say. Um, there are some discrepancies between where we've got waste management licence and installations and about how that process is managed internally uh, you know, with the agency. 
and, and I, I just written down here one quote from one of our permitting managers who told me, quote, if you apply for a standard rules permit, then it's brilliant easy and normally delivered on time. However, if you apply for a bespoke permit that does not fit the installations criteria, then it can take years to get a permit. And I think that's pretty much how, how, how we feel about it. Um, I'm told by uh, one of the guys who works for me, who rang me on the train, to say that the EP amendment regs 2009 uh, were put on yesterday, which actually makes some amendments for landfills um, which will be um, a, a slight, well, we will be clarify uh, for us. Um, so that's, that's good news as well. And as I said, I think there's just scope for further simplification. But, you know, there's still amount of confusion. So I've said, you know, for you guys in the room, don't worry. There's still plenty of work for lawyers out there. And I'm sure the waste industry will, uh, will keep you busy for, for a few years to come. Thank you.